So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Jana Iyengar. Uh, so I thought Jana- There's a question in the back. Oh, yeah. I believe the reviews are due November 14th. Yes, it's all on the site. It should be, there sh it should give you information when you log in. Um, uh, John Iyengar, so uh, I thought John would be a really good person uh, to invite here. Uh, okay, to invite here for today because um, there are folks who are doing research on the internet, there are folks who are working in the IETF, and John is one of the people who really bridges uh, both sides of the problem in the sense of clear views as to maybe things we could do better in the future combined with lots of really interesting stories about crazy, weird things that happen today, specifically uh, with respect to end-to-end. Uh, -end. And so, without further ado, Jana, take it away. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thank you, but I've heard somebody say this and I'll repeat it, make me earn it. I, it's very weird to see myself on those monitors, so I'm going to try and keep my eyes down below here. Um, well, thank you for, for, for coming here to the, to the talk. Before I get started, I just want to, a uh, uh, couple of ground rules. There really aren't any. Uh, so if you want to ask questions, just stop me at any point in time. This is for you, not so much for me. So, uh, and I, I enjoy a back and good back and forth, so feel free to stop me at any point in time. And if you have metaphorical peanuts, throw them at me, not real ones. Um, so, uh, I'm gonna try and talk about a few things today. It's, uh, I've tried to pull together a few things and hopefully it's, it's uh, instructive as well as interesting. Um, and, uh, and so the running theme is, is what's happened to end to end. And um, before I go into the talk, really, I want to quickly uh, say thanks to a bunch of folks who I worked with and who have been incredible uh, in terms of resources and folks I've learned from uh, quite a bit over the last few years uh, on, this, on, on, on the work that I'm going to talk about today. So um, let's start with a very important question that I'm sure nobody here has asked before. What is the internet? Anybody try to describe this for me. Go for it. <laughs> See, <laughs> very good. The answer I was looking for, the answer I would have loved to have said myself. Thank you for that. Um, so, well, you, well, you, I'm sure you use it for a million things. The one thing that I wanted to tell you is that the first time I heard about the internet was in my freshman year of college, my first year of college. It doesn't mean I'm that old. It just means that the internet's moved that fast. I mean, I heard about this for the first time, the word internet for the first time in 1995. I was an undergraduate student in India. And um, it's quite stunning how much it's become a part of our lives now. I have a six-year-old now who talks to me about downloading stuff. And I'm going, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, and that's how it's, that's how it's become. Um, and the real question that we ought to be asking is why? How did this happen? How did this come to be? So what are the other, what's the other big network that we know that existed before this? The telephone network, right? The most obvious one, the one that's still around. What's so different? What's why? What is the, what is the last big thing you saw come out of the telephone network? Come on. Video came out of the telephone network? What's it? Are Telephone providers, I'm sorry, say that again. They're starting to do that in cable TV. Oh, they're starting, right. They're starting to get into that. Um, but what was the last big innovation that you saw come out and, and scream at you? I remember one. Cellular touch tone or cellular. <laughs> yeah, cellular is a better option. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, have, I would have gone with call waiting, but <laughs> You know, well, so, so, um, um, and when was the last time you even started to think about what is the last big innovation that came out of the internet? You don't think of that. That's not a thought that even occurs to you. Because it happens on a regular basis and it happens on an everyday basis. Uh, the fundamental difference between these two, of course, is what we now know as the end-to-end -end principle. I'm sure you've, you've talked about this. I know that you've talked about this in class. Um, and uh, the phone network, was fundamentally a network where the network was smart, intelligent, and the ends were dumb, right? You remember the rotary phones? Anybody use those things? Fairly, yeah, I know. 
me too. I've actually done the, uh, if, you, if you've dialed with the rotary phone locked, I've done that too. Um, and um, on the internet, however, the fundamental difference between, like I said, the, the, the so on, on the phone network, innovation happened in the network and they were pushed out to the edges. So I got call waiting not because I was able to do something, but because the phone network decided I was worthy of it. And it appeared, right? And then I could subscribe to it and pay $10 a month to get a beep every time somebody called me. Um, on the internet, however, the network was formed with a very fundamentally different vision, right? I mean, this happened for a number of historical reasons, but as the network exists, we have uh, the end hosts, only the end hosts see past a packet's IP header. And the network only sees the IP header. That was the end-to-end -end principle. That was the original idea. And only the end hosts maintain hard state. Now, what do these two things give us? The fact that the end hosts uh, uh, are able to, are the only ones looking past an IP header gives us generality. What this means is that the network doesn't care what's past the IP header, as long as you can take whatever it is that you want to take and you can turn it into a packet and send it, the network will forward it for you. That's the goal. So if you take yourself and packetize yourself, the network will faithfully carry you. Well, not faithfully, but it will carry you anyways. <laughs> um, and similarly, if, well, you have to figure out how to do the smart stuff, right? Turning yourself into packets. And that was precisely what, where, we, where we excelled. We did that. We turned a lot of things into packets, and we use this network quite well. The other thing that we got with the end-to-end -end principle was uh, the fact that, um, that only the end host would maintain hard state. What do I mean by hard state? What I mean is that if there are two people communicating, two endpoints communicating, or more than two endpoints communicating, for the communication to break down, one of the endpoints has to break down. Right? If a network device breaks down, you the network would route around it and those soft failures can be recovered from as long as the endpoints are the only ones holding hard state that can be recovery that can happen so we had a network that looked like this or at least the end-to-end -end principle was was uh, a designed network that looked like this gave birth in some ways to a network that looked like this where you had end hosts and routers and the end hosts would talk um, other layers and the routers would talk ip at the network layer Right? So at this point, I want to switch and do a, a quick experiment. And I want to try something here. So how many of you know what Wireshark is? Come on, guys. How many of you don't know what Wireshark is? Let's see those hands now. All right. So I'm going to do the poor man's version of Wireshark, <laughs> which is also called TCP dump. Now, this is going to be a little <laughs> tricky. Um, see, I, I, I grew up on TCP dump. <laughs> Let's see now if I can get this. OK, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to connect back to my home server okay, at FNM. And I'm going to start looking at traces on both sides. And it's fairly straightforward. All I want to see is the IP address on both sides, and we'll see what's going on, right? So I'm going to start a TCP. Well, I'm going to start first a. I'm going to SSH into my home machine there at FNM, and that'll happen in a moment. Yes. Uh, Hang on for a second. Okay, I'm going to try and get this all to fit. I'm going to start a TCP dump on port 222 because that's the port that I'm SSHing on, or at least I'm trying to SSH on if this actually works. Maybe I'm disconnected. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Okay, somebody tell me what my password is. <laughs> hey, he's in trouble if something goes wrong now. <laughs> okay, let's see this again now, okay? Ooh, yay, packets. <laughs> uh, okay, close your eyes, everybody. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a TCP dump on both sides, okay? And we're going to look at something fairly straightforward. Um, what do you see on this side is a TCP dump that's running locally on my system here, okay? And if you're not, if you're not familiar with this output, I'll just show you what these are. Uh, it's not very much really. It's, this is a timestamp that shows you the current time and that says it's an IP packet and that says that's the source of this packet, the source IP of this packet followed by the port number from which this packet is leaving here, right? Or at least the packet, the source of the packet itself. And this is the destination IP and port. So can you all see this? It's heading to the right port. It's heading to port 222. That's where I'm SSHing in. So life is good, okay? So that's my local IP address. Let's make sure that in fact is my local IP address. So I'm gonna get out here again. And yes, that looks like my local IP address. So I'm going to go back and run that again and go in here and run a TCP dump on that side as well. Okay. So I think we have enough data at this time. What I'm going to show you here is here's my local IP address. Here's a destination IP address in port. And I would expect to see at the other side packets going in the same direction you know, packets that are coming from this IP address to that IP address. And so at the remote end, at my home machine, what do I see instead? What do I see? The public IP, uh, public IP instead of private IP. What do you mean public IP instead of private IP? I think the 10.22 might be a private IP that Stanford is giving you. Okay. Uh, and the 68.85 might be the public IP that Stanford is using to communicate with you. To using to communicate with me where? Uh, to, with uh, your home server. So what's happening? What's happening to my IP address? You're sitting behind a NAT. I'm behind a NAT. I'm behind a NAT. And as I'm looking at this, I'm realizing that I'm not behind a port translator. But anyhow, my IP address from here goes out, my packet leaves into the, into the ethernets <coughs> and <laughs> gets <laughs> translated into something else. So somebody in there is doing something. Let me go back to my slides and I want to ask you now, <coughs> who in here <coughs> is doing anything like this? <coughs> Nobody. What's it? Theoretically, no one. <laughs> well, in this, nobody is doing it. So either my picture of the network is wrong, which just cannot be the case, right? <laughs> <laughs> or the picture is wrong. Um, <laughs> so what we've had over the years is what I'm, I'm going to call the rise of the middle. Um, as the internet has become, has gone from being this homegrown experiment, not homegrown, but this experimental network, to this sort of critical network that people have used and have learned to uh, 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 make uh, part of everything that they do, um, an increasing amount of intelligence has started to become a part of the network. And what you just saw was a NAT, which is essentially something that translates headers. And you talked about this in the class, right? And you have, in fact, seen this. And if you've not seen this every day, I'm going to show you one of these. NAT. <laughs> Everybody carries one, and this is something that's it's 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 important for me to show this to you because sometimes you don't realize how pervasive these things are. It's not hidden somewhere in Stanford's you know basement. It's in your house. It's something you look and you go, oh my god, look at that! It's so cute, <laughs> and you buy it because it's 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 white and all of that. <laughs> but um, but it's it, the 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 critical point here is that uh, a lot of the stuff that we buy and we use this this is incredibly pervasive. 
and these kinds of uh, this kind of intelligent middle boxes have started to become have become uh, part of the network fundamentally so we just saw NATs. We saw these kinds of boxes do translation. They, in fact, also do port translation. And uh, we won't talk about that much more, but you'll see me uh, talk about it through the talk um, uh, as I hit different middle boxes. So the other kind that you're probably generally familiar with are firewalls. Right? What do firewalls do? Well, they protect you. At least that's what they say they do. Right? And um, they also enforce network policy. So if you can't use BitTorrent, it's probably because there's a firewall in there doing something funny, <coughs> right? Or at least protecting, so to speak, the network from the um, barrage of data that BitTorrent brings. So um, firewalls protect the network, protect the user. That's the uh, general goal. And they also enforce network policy. So operators love them because they're able to use them to enforce network policy. Traffic shapers are something that you may have heard about, that you may have seen. Um, but basically, what they do is uh, they, ba they manage bandwidth and delay. And these are really fun boxes. I mean, they're fun boxes because the kinds of traffic shapers that are out there are, are, are uh, out of the world. Um, and these are commonly employed. These are very commonly employed by enterprises. I don't know if Stanford has one. I'm guessing it does. Uh, a lot of uh, enterprises have traffic shapers that manage traffic inside the network, uh, or at least cordon off different pieces of traffic inside the network and so on. So <coughs> these are very commonly employed as well. And then there are these things that you may not have heard about called PEPs, or performance enhancing proxies. And these are fantastic boxes again. And all these are very useful boxes, by the way. I'm going to talk about that too. Um, performance enhancing proxies are essentially boxes that are deployed by operators in the network to optimize performance over problematic links, like satellite links. Let's say that you have a satellite link, and you want to use that to provide a service to some person who's on the other side of the satellite link. And as it turns out, TCP performance sucks on satellite links. So you have to do something to fix it. Right? And then you go get these boxes called PEPs, put them on two sides of a satellite link, and suddenly everything is good again. The types of proxies that NetZero deployed earlier on to enhance the experience for dial-up users? Oh, interesting. I actually don't know, but it could be. They did things where they would compress the image. So if you went to a web page and there was a larger JPEG, they would actually compress sure. the image before actually delivering it to you? Sure. I mean, if you weren't explicitly pointing your browser to that proxy, then it is probably something like this that's on, on path. So the, the line as to where they stop optimizing is, is doesn't exist. They can, they'll try to optimize whatever they can um, and go into web page, into, into the payload as deep as they can to optimize stuff. So um, these, are, uh, these are PEPs, and there's a, there's a whole RFC that talks about these, 31, 35, if you're interested. So all of this is great, right? I mean, these are actually helping us use the network better. I mean, if you look at this, you should think, these are solving problems. What's the problem with this, right? They're solving real problems that we have in the network. And this is all great, except they, well, well, they all solve important problems for operators, and that's a, that's a wonderful thing, except that they're also eroding transport end to end. Oh. They're also basically breaking something. And um, what I mean by this is that middle box essentially need to interact with the transport layer. They need to interact with the transport layer. They want to do anything at all. Now think about this for a moment, right? Routers look as far as IP. Anything that looks beyond that, we assumed was an end host. If you want something to do something beyond just routing, you're going to have to interact with the transport layer. So they need to interact with the transport layer to be smarter than a router and just forward packets. So NATs interact with the port number in your transport, in your TCP header, in your UDP header, and they interact with the checksum. And other, the other ones that we talked about generally interact with most TCP header fields. And not just the header fields. It's not just that they're looking at a packet header and they're going, I'm going to replace this with something else. They actually interact with the state machine. Have you seen the TCP state machine yet? Yeah. Here? So they actually interact. What I mean by they interact with the state machine is these, just think about this, OK? You have a sender and a receiver. Both of them are maintaining a state machine, and they're keeping them in sync. You have a box in the middle that's trying to do the same thing for every flow. It's a little astounding, but you have uh, uh, boxes that actually do that as well. And uh, there are a number of examples that uh, I could give you. One, uh, what kinds of header fields do they, do they step on? They step on the sequence number field. Uh, they step on the act number field. They step on the flags. 
um, they can turn packets into completely different. If they step on the receive window, the advertised receive window that is supposed to be something that comes from the receiver, that can be stepped on as well by these boxes. And they do actually uh, for performance reasons. So um, an example is a traffic shaper that controls bandwidth share. Now this is something you will encounter when you see TCP congestion control and how TCP performance depends on the round trip time of the path. I won't talk about this in much more detail, but to say that TCP throughput is inversely proportional to the round trip time of the flow. Now this can be used if you're a traffic shaper and you want to give lesser share of the bandwidth to a TCP flow, what do you do? You increase the round trip time. You hold off on, if you have a flow where data is coming through, you hold acts, you delay the acknowledgements and don't send them off until a certain amount of time has passed. So you're basically buffering acts, you're keeping them there, increasing the round trip time, and as a result, the TCP flow reduces its uh, <coughs> throughput, uh, gets its throughput reduced. So we have, <coughs> we also have a fire, we, there's, there's this uh, a recent paper which talked about a firewall that actually, or some middle box that corrected the acknowledgement number. That corrected, just think about this for a second. There's a sender that sends data, the receiver sends an acknowledgement, and there's a middle box that's correcting the acknowledgement number. And that did happen. Uh, it was a particular experiment where they were trying to figure out what would, what kinds of TCP modifications would actually work in the network. And they found that this one doesn't because when they sent an acknowledgement that for which data hadn't been seen yet, there was a middle box that actually stepped in and said, hey, there's no data for this yet. So it corrected it, um, which is quite cool. So as a result, what we have now is that the transport layer is no longer end to end. We have uh, uh, the network, we, we essentially have these middle boxes that are interposing on the, um, the, the transport and you know, often, oftentimes the application space as well, looking as far down into the data as possible. So with eroding transport end to endness, what else do we lose? Well, we lose generality. Going back to the point about what can we, what do we get for transport end to endness? Um, we lose generality when we lose end to endness and we also lose fate sharing. One of these boxes that actually maintains state, if it, if it, if it goes kaput, then your state, your connection can be left in a, in, in a strange state where the sender and the receiver can't synchronize anymore without the help of this middle box. And that's a bad thing, but we lose, we definitely get that. We lose fate sharing with hard state inside the network. And here's a more uh, 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 general question. It used to be the case that if you had an IP address and if you are, your IP address was routable, you could be reached over the network, right? What is reachability in this case? How do we define reachability now with middle boxes that may or may not allow your packets to go through, that may or may not allow your packets to go through depending on the time of day, that may or may not allow your packets to go through depending on what packets you've seen before, and so on and so forth. So how do you define reachability in this space? It's a hard question. It's a very hard question. In fact, it's a question that I've been trying to break my head on for a little while, and um, I'll, I'll invite ideas on this. So um, middle boxes have essentially become new architectural control points. What do I mean by this? What's an architectural control point? It's a control, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a point, it's a device in the network that actually controls what the internet can do. And, and the emphasis here is on can, right? It's a device that controls, that limits perhaps what the internet can do, what you can do on the internet. And the funny thing is this, these were not meant to be control points. These are not designed to be control points. These are accidental. And this is where you find the problem that they, they don't fit in an architecture that was that existed because they weren't really built to be control points. They were built to uh, fix small things. And I'll, I'll go back here to something that you've uh, seen. RFC 1641. Has everybody read this one so far? But it describes NATS. It's, it's, it's from 1994, I think. Um, and it describes NATS. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a specification for NATS. And I just want to read this because I think it's, it's very, uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful uh, description. Um, the two most compelling problems facing the IP internet are IP address depletion and scaling and routing. Until the long term solutions are ready, an easy way to hold down the demand for IP addresses is through address reuse. 1994. Okay, and the NAT proposal says, here's a short-term solution. And in the conclusion of this document, you get this. 
NAT has several negative characteristics that make it inappropriate as a long term solution and may make it inappropriate even as a short term <laughs> solution. I love this sentence, right? I mean, the authors of this document just know how bad an idea this is. In fact, there's a list of things that can go wrong, and the last one element in the list says it breaks FTP, SNMP, you name it. <laughs> and this is, this is very telling. We always knew that this was a problem, and yet we couldn't control this beast once it got out. Right? The, once the idea was out there, it went, it took over in some ways, and it became a control point, and we couldn't do anything about it. So, um, so, so what do these things do? They be, become accidental control points, and they've also made our internet flakier in some ways. Why is the internet flaky because of this? Well, the first thing is that they've created packet black holes. If I send a packet into the network now, I do not know if it's going to make it to the other side. Right? I do not know what in that packet is going to trip up some middle box somewhere along the way, and it, my packet's not going to get there. Just try this as an experiment. Take out your, you know, your cell phone or whatever it is, and take out another device and try to kind of talk between the two. It's becoming increasingly hard to just do that, to just have a TCP connection between two devices that are connected to the network. <coughs> and I don't know on what paths this packet will get through. Maybe on one path it does, suddenly it doesn't. And uh, uh, this is sort of what these middle boxes are doing. And cheap boxes are common. This one isn't very cheap, right? as you know. But there are cheaper ones available, and those are by far selling more than this one is. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to proselytize for Apple. I'm not. <laughs> but I, I, I do, I mean, there are cheap boxes, and they are buggy because they're cheap. And, uh, and it's actually an interesting thing. I, I sort of try to look at this, and I don't know if there's causality in this at all. But uh, um, a lot of the ma middle box vendors tend to be hardware sort of folks who also sell things like power strips and so on. And you know, it's, it's actually it's interesting. Uh, Cisco does sell some of these, but I uh, don't know how much the, the folks in, uh, um, in uh, those guys actually understand. I mean, this is just me. I, did, I just don't know how much they understand networking protocols and how much they treat, it as, treat them as static bits on the wire. So, but almost all of our traffic goes through these boxes, right? Almost all of our traffic is going through these boxes. So when you think about the internet and it being as flaky as the weakest point in the network or on a path, you have these boxes which are sitting right there staring at you. So we have all of these boxes and well, as it stands though, they all work with TCP, right? They all work with UDP. Uh, and <coughs> oh, as a story I want to tell you about one of these, uh, uh, the, the, so maybe I'll get to it later. If I get to it later, remind me about this. If you have time, remind me of this. Uh, there's a, uh, a sequence number randomization module that caused some havoc. And I'll get to it if I can. So, um, so do we need, the question really is, do we need new transports? If TCP works, if UDP works, do we need new transports then? Well, the network as it is works, right? I mean, yes, there are problems with it, but we seem to be able to do fine, right? So if you were to ask the question, do we need new transports, uh, uh, you'd say, isn't TCP enough? It seems to do everything I want it to do. Isn't it enough? I'll ask you one question, or at least I'll, uh, there are a number of ways in which I can answer this, a number of reasons I could give you, but I could just tell you one thing. Think about end-to-end -end multipath. What do I mean by end-to-end -end multipath? You've written sockets programs. Has everybody written a sockets program? Do you know what a sockets program is? How many endpoints, how many IP addresses does a TCP connection have on each end? One. How many IP addresses can my iPhone have? Can, not does, can. Two plus. I can have multiple addresses, I can have multiple globally routable addresses on my device now. Right? And this is becoming an increasingly important problem as we carry these mobile devices around which are capable of using multiple homes is that we want to be able to use them all. If I walk out of here, I want my uh, data stream to be able to seamlessly move from one, uh, using one interface to the other as I move out of this, uh, this wireless space into a cellular space. I want to be able to do that. And I can't do that with TCP easily. So what did we do? Well, we came up with a solution. It was called Stream Control Transmission Protocol, or SCDP. Uh, and SCDP, how, have you heard of SCDP? You have. Became an RFC in 2000. 
and it had multi homing built into it native multi homing i mean this was fantastic this was just great stuff at the time you could just imagine what all you could do with multi homing it was really fun to work with this stuff um but we haven't yet seen wild deployment of this we haven't seen wild enough deployment but the problem persists we still want to use multiple interfaces we still want to do multi path to the point that we've come back and we're now trying to retrofit tcp with multi homing so there are two questions that should come up one the f the first one is not a question it sort of answers a question that we asked before saying that well we don't have everything that we need we want to be able to grow we have pressures to build more stuff that uh, or more features and more services that we want to be able to uh, use and uh, the sec the the question is why are we retrofitting tcp with multipath stuff uh and if, and you should be asking that question um we we'll come back to this question in in a, in a, in, a, in a bit hopefully um and um what are apps doing in the meanwhile when we're trying to build a cdp and, and and put it out on the on the on the network we are not able to do this because there are middle boxes is largely why i see but didn't get deployed widely is because of middle boxes because middle boxes even today after 12 years of this being an rfc um we still have middle boxes that just go sctp who and uh, drop packets drop sctp packets that hit them and the most of the middle boxes in fact do this so they've sort of uh, exercised their architecture control point behavior and they've decided that this is not going to happen or they haven't decided actively but that's what's happened um and what are apps doing in the meanwhile because apps are dealing with this issue right if you're watching something or if you're doing something an application wants to be able to use multiple interfaces as you move on and as you move from one uh, space to another what they end up doing is they end up building abstractions on top of tcp and on top of udp okay so <coughs> what we have is is a uh, uh, multi path multi streaming a whole bunch of other slew of other services that are being built atop tcp and udp now is this a um uh, there's a great example for this which is adobe's rtmfp uh, anybody familiar with this so adobe flash when you run a flash when you watch flash it it uses a protocol that they built internally called rtmfp that basically builds an entire transport stack on top of udp the last i checked it was udp but i heard that they were also doing it on top of tcp but we have entire stacks being built on top of udp and tcp entire transport stacks being built on top of udp and tcp simply because those are the things that get through the network exactly this to allow people to build their own protocols on top so um udp so the first thing is if you look at the udp rfc it's four pages and it was designed to be a trivial transport protocol yeah. and so it, was, it wasn't designed so that you could go out and build new transports and deploy them on top of it i i wouldn't say that at least if you look at the original rfc it's it's very clear in terms of what its uh, purpose was at the time um and right so um the fact that it's become that the fact that we now think of udp as the deployment as the place where you can deploy new things is 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 interesting um but i wouldn't say it was the primary purpose right but we do this we do this, and that's the one way that we can get around doing uh, a deployment of new transports so um so we're trying to build these new transports they're not getting deployed we have these applications that are building their own rolling their own stuff and we have the transport layer basically being stuck in this evolutionary log jam right so we have um so before i move on i want to stop here and just take a moment and ask if you have any questions or any thoughts so far yes i'm at, actually interested in whether or not you could define middle boxes a little more because it seems to me that um different autonomous systems might want to implement their own policies right regard to the traffic that they're willing to route and one of the things about sctp is if i'm thinking as a network administrator i have a new type of traffic that end to end could traverse my network. I have to be conscious about do I want to allow that traffic on my network or not. Sure. So to to when we talk about middle boxes are we talking about um the routers that are doing the BGP route advertisement and actually handling the transit traffic on the internet or are we more talking about I'm an AT&T customer and AT&T doesn't want to allow me to do certain things on their network. Uh the latter I mean what what I'm talking about when I say middle boxes the kind of middle box that you just described was something that enforces network policy 
A router doesn't do that. A router simply forwards packets. Right. So it, it's a middle box that's actually looking further, much further past the IP header to see what it can do. And I'm, they, they're legitimate. There are legitimate reasons why they're being deployed. Um, but yeah, that's what I call, that's what I'm calling a middle box. But they're in general within an autonomous system that has, you know, that that AS is actually implementing their policy. It can be, so. I mean, I, I mean, guess maybe another way to look at it is if we didn't have this issue of NAT, let's say the world just went IP6, sure. and NATs went away because we think that's a good idea. Um, yeah. And we have this this end to end model again. Um, where then things like SCTP would then become possible. Okay. So so uh, so this is a we can have this conversation for a while because I uh, what you just said here you said that in IPv6 internet when NATs go away. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. That just maybe that's just me. But uh, uh, the the, um, the second thing is NATs aren't the only middle boxes. Firewalls, like I said, are middle boxes that are going to remain there. It doesn't matter <coughs> what network you're running because they're operating at a different level altogether. Right? I mean, they're trying to and, and, and similarly with traffic shapers or, simi or with performance enhancing proxies. They don't care about what's lying underneath v4 or v6. It's not about address scarcity. NATs are about address scarcity. Performance enhancing proxies are about performance over problematic links. They have much more to do with TCP end-to-end -end congestion control than they have to do with uh, v4 or v6 addresses. Okay? I mean, uh, uh, does, that, does that sort of answer your question? I mean, we, can, we can continue yeah. this perhaps later. Um, right. I do want to get to some more um, substantive slides as well. Any other questions? Okay. So the transport layer is stuck in this, in this log jam. And um, one of the things that we did was we tried to identify why this was happening or why, why was it the case that, that we were having this particular issue. And we, uh, but we tried to break the transport up into constituent parts. Right? And we found that the transport conflated a lot of different issues. It conflated endpoint identification in the form of port numbers. It also conflated congestion control that you haven't seen yet, uh, uh, but those had to do much more with, uh, with performance concerns. And then it also had your byte stream and reliable transmission stuff that's happening that's much more to do with what, I, what the application expects this transport to do. So it conflated a whole bunch of different functions, some of them which had to do with the network underneath, some of them that had to do with the application above, and so you have these application-oriented functions and these network-oriented functions that were sort of conflated in this space, in this transport space. And when you had a middle box that wanted to just do one of these functions, want to interpose on one of these functions, it had no choice but to interpose on the entire transport. And um, and 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 uh, we have. Um, so I'm not going to go into this much more, but uh, but we we sort of looked at this and we said. Uh, how do you build a network where you could actually expose the information that middle boxes want? Because they're doing legitimate stuff. Right? A lot of them are doing stuff that we want them to do. And we can still have transport evolvability. And so we, we sort of, we came and, and, and we tried to think about this question of how can you build an internet with middle boxes as first class citizens in them? If you were to think about an internet now, if you were to build it now knowing that middle boxes are, serve an important valuable purpose, how would you build it? And we weren't the first ones to do this. A number of folks have already uh, taken their shot at this. And so we also took our shot because we thought we had a different perspective on this problem. And so we tried to sort of break the transport up into these constituent parts. And we had some fun with it. Um, it was a really valuable exercise because it allowed us to uh, uh, think about um, how you could design an internet and what you could get for it, what benefits you would get for it if you actually went out and did this. Um, and we found some really neat results, which was quite interesting, because once we broke it apart, we thought about how you could uh, exploit this breaking up of functions. And we were able to do some cool stuff with it. Uh, and that was fun. Um, I won't go into that here, but uh, uh, I also want to hone in on the fact that, on, on the point that I, I, this thought experiment was also useful for us in terms of uh, uh, allowing us to see TCP in a different light allowing us to see TCP for what all it's doing. And we were able to um, uh, use that decomposition to think about a different 
uh, role for DCP in this space. Uh, I will be more precise now, what I am trying to say is that uh, we want to come back to the world which has its middle boxes, which they exist and TCP or the middle boxes like I said interpose on these functions. Right, so that so we broke the transport broadly speaking. Even if you don't understand everything that's going on in here, it's quite okay. All I want you to know is that this, you can draw sort of a dotted line here and say there are functions in here that the network cares about, and there are functions up here that the application cares about, but the network generally doesn't care about. But in order to be able to step on these functions, it has to step on the whole thing, on the whole protocol, okay, on the whole state machine. There's no choice. So we said. Is it possible for us to keep the bottom part here, retain the strength of the, bo of the bottom part, which is that middle boxes can, you can work with it, but open up the top part here, right? And allow for different abstractions to appear. So we came up with uh, design assumptions, which uh, if you want to deploy something new on the extent, uh, the, on, on, the, on the current internet, you want to be able to uh, if you want, want, want these services to be deployable, these assumptions hold uh, for this network, which is that new end-to-end -end services should not require changes to middle boxes. Again, the, the, the emphasis here is on require. It's not on the fact that middle boxes won't change, but you can't require changes before any deployment happens. Okay, and there's a consequence. The consequence is that new end-to-end -end services must appear as legacy protocols on the wire. Okay, so on the wire, a middle box that's looking at this protocol, picking up the packets or the wire, should be able to look at this and go, that's TCP. I know what to do with this stuff. It tracks the state machine. I can interact with it and so on. So this is where we went eventually after our, uh, our, our uh, intellectual exercise with, with sort of trying to build a new architecture. And we came up with this thing called the Minion Suite. The Minion Suite. So what is the, the, the Minion Suite? Well, very in, in one slide, it's a packet, we call it a packet pack horse. It's basically something that can carry packets for you in some ways for deploying new transports. So the idea is that you want to be able to build new transports on top of Menion. It uses legacy protocols. We stick with uh, legacy protocols because those are the ones that get through the network. And we use them as a substrate. So our goal here is to not use them as transport protocols, but as protocols that can be turned into efficient solid substrates because they get us through the network. And we build new services that apps want on top of this. Okay? So I'm, I'm throwing a bunch of different uh, 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 services here, and we've tried to build some of them. Some of them we still haven't fully done. But the idea here is to be able to offer new services that applications are looking for, and we're trying to build new transports for, and we're saying, can we use an existing protocol wire format and open it up to provide these new services? Why would you use TCP as a substrate for TCP if you're looking for things like on order delivery? That's a very good. That's a that's a that's a great question. If that's all you're looking for, if if you're looking for, a, so so, so right. If UDP suffices, if UDP is all you need, then that's <coughs> entirely fine. But there are a lot of applications that end up using TCP because they want the congestion control, because they want the flow control, because they want the, well, maybe not the reliability, maybe the reliability, but the only thing they don't care about is the ordered delivery. So there's a whole slew, right, in between UDP and TCP, there's a whole spectrum of services that could be offered. And they sort of represent these two far, far distant spectrums. But doesn't that preclude you from innovating on things like the congestion control algorithm because you're, you're locked into whatever TCP is using? Um, so why so 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 that's something that I can actually challenge. Uh, why do you, why would you say that? Why do you think you're logged into the TCP congestion control algorithm? Which yeah. what is the TCP congestion control algorithm, by the way? I don't know. There's plenty of them, but right. You just you just said you, are, you mean you just you, you just said that there are plenty of them. So which one are you logged into? Well, if you're using it as a <coughs> and you're trying to build on top, then presumably you're leaving the underlying piece alone. But the underlying piece. So so. Um, so that's a, that's okay. So generally speaking, yes, I, I, I would agree with you. Uh, the congestion control piece, however, my argument is that it's 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 something that can be changed. We in fact, if you, if you look at you know, if you have a Linux system, go look this up. You'll find that the last time I checked, there were eleven congestion control modules that you could plug in to the Linux kernel. I actually think this is a good question because it kind of brings up the difference between thinking of the protocol as the specification of what the protocol needs to do in order to be recognized as TCP and the specific implementation which, yes, you can, right. you can see different congestion control algorithms. Yeah, it's so, so the, the congestion control algorithm actually, uh, what it does is it gives you, so middle boxes generally, 
don't go after timing. That's what congestion control in some ways controls. It's the timing of packets. And uh, there aren't very many middle boxes that really, I don't know of any that look at that and modify their behavior according to that timing. <coughs> Um, and as I said, we, we already do deploy a number of different congestion control algorithms. Windows uses a different one, Linux uses a different one, Mac uses a different one. Even now we have this slew. And Linux, like I said, has pluggable congestion control. You can plug any one of them in, your reachability through the network is not going to change. You'll still get through the network just fine. Your performance might, right? So the fundamental problem of reachability doesn't have to do so much with congestion control or timing of packets. It has to do much more with the packet format or the wire format. Does that answer your question? So uh, I, will, I will add another piece to it, which is that my, well, one of the things that I've been thinking is that congestion control, making it pluggable is something that's going to become something that we will do for all operating systems anyways, simply because we carry around devices that can plug into different kinds of network types. I mean, you have a congestion control algorithm that works for uh, Wi-Fi versus something that works for the wired internet. Um, you have different ones that work better for different types, different network types, and you want to be able to use those. So uh, I think that's going to happen anyways. So, yeah. Just to clarify that, um, what you're saying is that you, the format that you're using on the wire is TCP or sufficiently close that it will recognize TCP. But right. the behavior at the end is not necessarily right. confined to TCP, which allows you to right. do things like unordered packet delivery, even though Excellent. it yes. has sequence numbers that are supposed to not work that way. Right, something like that, yes. So we're going to try and tease that about. We're going to try and see how far we can stretch this idea. Right. But that's the goal. Yes, exactly. So um, what are our main goals? You already, excellent, good work. I don't have to really go over this. So the question is really, how far can we stretch this wire format? I mean, if you have this wire format, that's, that's, if that's the problem, if we have, if we can establish that middle boxes are stuck to the wire format, and by wire format, I also mean the state machine, okay? but not the timing. So if you know that middle boxes are stuck to the wire format, then the question is, how far can you stretch this? How much freedom do we have in this space? Right? And that's something we wanted to explore. And as a side effect, we also wanted to basically say that well, TCP is being used as a substrate. Let's just make it a good one. You know? If it's being used, it's something that's happening. How about we eliminate latencies in there and buffering delays in there and make it like a solid, nice little substrate that actually does well. So those were our goals uh, in some ways. And <coughs> Uh, Minion's strength, as we've built it, is that it actually works. What I mean by that is that it can be deployed. We had some goals about deployability, and it can easily be, de it can be deployed. It will work on the network as it is, and it gives you what it promises. It does on the internet as is, without wishing that it changes. So um, I, I, I just want to give you something here from uh, an NSDI review. So this paper was published at NSDI this year. Uh, and I, there was a review that we got, which I, which I really like because it really describes this precisely. And so it's a reasonably performing solution to what is sadly a real practical problem. And it accepts the new narrow ways as CCP and shows that with enough devious thought, I love that, <laughs> with enough devious thought, one can manage to implement functionality at cross purposes with TCP atop it. Now, as it turned out, they put this in the strengths of the paper and that in the weaknesses of the paper. And well, you know, you can put them in whatever bin you want. Uh, in some ways, it's a question of accepting what we have right now. So what's in the Minion suite? Um, I won't throw this entire shebang at you. I'll break it down a little bit. Minion has basically some extensions to TCP. Okay, so we muck around with the core in kernel under the uh, uh, API and under the sockets API a bit. And then we build this library Okay, that's sort of a protocol suite on top of it that gives us uh, an unordered datagram delivery API. An unordered datagram delivery API is quite powerful because you can build on top of it. You can build stuff on top of it. You can build on top of an unordered datagram. You can build partial ordering. You can build multi-streaming. You can build all sorts of interesting things. So what I'm going to talk about here is just this and UCOBS. But, uh, we also do have UDP in here. So somebody asked the question about why would I use TCP if I could use UDP? And the answer is I wouldn't. If UDP was sufficient, then I would stick with UDP. Right? I mean, that's sort of what you want to do is the application doesn't care what transport you're using underneath. That's a function of whether the transport actually works on the network or not. So um, 
So that's generally the menu suite. Uh, so I'll, I'll go into UTCP here, what UTCP is, and into UCOBS here, and I'll show you how we can build applications on top of this and what we get for doing this, uh, and so on. So what's UTCP? Well, it's unordered TCP. We were really surprised that this wasn't taken. And when we came up with UTCP, we said, somebody's got to have thought about this. And we looked around, looked around, and nobody had taken up UTCP, which was interesting. Uh, we introduced new, two new socket options. Uh, in in Linux, well, it, it's not. We built it in Linux. We haven't shipped it into the kernel yet. But uh, we introduce S on order receive, and what this does is that the receiver, the receiving kernel, delivers any data that it receives immediately without holding it back. And I'll I'll show you what that means in a moment. And we also introduce an S on order send on the send side, which allows us the application to specify a priority as data is going down into the socket. So any data that goes down to the socket is accepted in kernel with a priority and gets placed in a priority queue in kernel. And these two have pretty significant effects. Yes? So what's <laughs> 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 it's connection oriented. It has flow control. I mean, it has everything in TCB except for the order. Uh, okay. But I mean, you have, uh, so, so, so yes. So, so it's, it's I mean, okay, so it's just like all the TCP except for order. Except order, right. At this point, anyways. Um, again, reachability is an important point. We, I, no protocol is close to me. Is not, I'm, uh, Minion doesn't distinguish. The, the question here is, is UDP reachable all the time? So that's one thing I didn't say earlier, which is that, as it turns out, UDP is not actually reachable everywhere. If anybody here has worked on firewall policy, there are some firewall po firewalls that actually blanket deny UDP packets into the network. That happens. Cisco used to do this. I shouldn't say this loud. It's on video. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so there are, there are networks <coughs> that blanket block UDP packets altogether. How do you reach that network? You all, maybe you heard about HTTPS tunneling, where everything goes through HTTPS. The reason that these kind of solutions exist is because UDP doesn't get through everywhere. So what we're trying to build here is a substrate that will sort of work. Doesn't matter what protocol it uses, right? And we want every protocol to be able to provide um, a maximal set of interfaces up about the application, so to speak. So, um, <coughs> so you should be looking at this and going, "This is strange. How do you do unordered receive and send on SOC stream? Right? SOC stream is a byte stream. It dumps bytes in order, and I'm doing unordered send and receive of a byte stream. So let's look at this." Uh, this is standard TCP, right? In order, data arrives here, and the application is sitting up here. Data gets delivered up to the TCP stack, and the application reads it off right there. Um, and this is in order, so it gets delivered immediately on the read. When data arrives out of order, if there's a gap in the delivery sequence, and the application is still waiting on a read, it's blocked on a read, that data still gets queued out here. Right? Because the TCP stack isn't going to deliver this until the missing, missing region, the missing packet here, is received, which comes in, and then TCP delivers everything up. Right? This is your standard TCP behavior that you're used to. And <coughs> with, with UTCP, uh, when data comes in order, it's delivered up immediately. And that's all the same. When data comes out of order, it gets queued, but it's also delivered immediately up to the application. So we don't hold back any data in the kernel. Deliver everything up to the application. Okay? And when data arrives in order, that's also delivered back up. So everything just gets delivered up. TCP still does everything it does, but it doesn't hold back from delivering data to the application. It's a fairly simple change. Um, but we also, we also give up the, we also deliver up the sequence number so the application can do fun things with it. Now, the application, you're sitting up here on top of this red line. You're, top, you're sitting in user space. And what you're doing is you're reading. And as you're reading, what are you getting? You're getting a bunch of unordered bytes. You're getting these byte fragments that are sort of all over the place. right? And there's no inherent structure in this byte stream. You're getting data. You're getting fragments that could begin anywhere, end anywhere. You know that it's in sequence within the fragment, but that's about all you know. That doesn't tell you anything about the structure of that data within uh, what you want to deliver to the application above. So <coughs> UTCP receives and delivers arbitrary unordered fragments from this data stream, from the byte stream. Yeah? And 
what we want to be able to do is create a framing that allows us to, to figure out meaningful messages in arbitrary byte blobs. Okay, and I'm not going to get into this uh, into this framing mechanism, uh, this encoding mechanism called COBS, uh, which we use here. Um, but the idea is fairly straightforward: is that we basically take a message, we uh, put zeros to both ends of an application of the application message, we COBS encode the entire message, and it, uh, COBS uh, encoding basically eliminates zeros from this message, so that when you when the receiver sees two zeros, it knows there's a whole application message in the middle there. Yeah, and it does this with a very very low overhead, which is quite fantastic. Uh, it does it with 0.4 percent overhead. As it turns out, it just occurred to me that Cobb's came out of Stanford. Uh, Stuart Cheshire, who did his dissertation work here many years ago, uh, did with the Cobb's was his PhD work. So, um, hooray! Um, so the, the reason we're doing this is because an application generally when it receives, so think about an audio application, right? It receives frames from down below. But if it receives a part of a frame, it cannot do very much with it. Maybe there are applications that can, but generally speaking, you want to receive the entire frame. And that's what we want to try and achieve here. Even if it's not in order, we want to be able to deliver a full frame to the application. Okay? So that's what COBS allows us to do. We can with COBS, we can find frames are in, in any part of the data stream as long as all the parts of it are there we are able to we can extract that entire frame and deliver it up to the application um, so how do you use minion um, a sender cobs encodes messages and sends them with UTCP and I'm not going into this part of it very much um, for want of time but I encourage you to go look this up if you care um, this is actually quite fun. Um, we got a few things here which were really interesting. Um, at the receive side, we um, have the receiver manage out of order data and extract these messages and deliver them out to the application without regard to order. So the application receives data, even if there's a gap, the application gets data. So here's the, the driving, here's, here's the key point that you want to understand. What we have achieved here is unordered delivery with TCP. Okay, another datagram or message uh, in this case, uh, delivery with TCP. All right. So why is this useful? Well, let's try out a couple of uh, example applications. How much time do I have? Okay. Okay. So I'll try to wrap this up in five minutes because I want to be able to field questions. Uh, okay. So uh, one application that I'll show you, and I, I I'll, I'll skip the the second application is, is uh, voice over IP. It's a very classic example of something that you normally want to run on UDP. But as it turns out, um, I want to come back to this question of why not UDP? Because I think it deserves a better answer than I've given so far. I'll come back to that after this. So um, um, it traditionally uses uh, UDP, but it also, in many cases, ends up using TCP for a number of reasons, one of them being reachability. Um, <coughs> but they tend to be delay sensitive, and long uh, retransmission delays Recovery delays can, are very perceptible and can frustrate users. Um, these codecs tend to be sensitive to burst losses, highly sensitive to burst losses. They can manage losses of one or two frames. They can sort of interpolate over them and, 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 and deliver audio to the user. But if there's a burst loss, they don't do that well. Okay? And <coughs> this is something that we can fix with Minion. So here's an experiment where we ran um, a real codec in a um, uh, in a, a real network environment, uh, and we we had a, a WAV file being transmitted and being received to the other side, and decoded by the codec, and we used a, a, a jitter buffer that was more than three times that of the round, three times the round trip time. And what you're seeing here, I'll explain this to you very quickly, is loss burst length. Remember what I just told you, right? VoIP codecs are sensitive to burst losses, so the further that the losses are on this x-axis, the worse it is for the codec, the receiving side. Um, and this shows you the fraction of frames that were received in this experiment um, with so many burst losses. So UDP is up here on the blue. The green is TCP. Can somebody tell me why this happens with TCP? Why is it that TCP appears to the VoIP codec as having a ton of burst losses?
then everything else is going to be waiting behind it. Right. So you get a first arrival, essentially. Exactly. From an application's point of view, it doesn't know one packet was lost. The application is not getting any of the data that is that are right now sitting in the kernel queued up, perhaps. Right. So at the moment that recovery happens, that uh, that loss gets recovered. Uh, Everything gets delivered up and you have a burst delivery up to the application. <coughs> but by then it may be too late. So it appears as a burst loss to DCP. And we avoid exactly that problem with Minion, right? Because we don't hold back data uh, uh, that's, that's uh, going to cause a problem for applications like this. So there's another one which I'm not going to go over right now, but I'd love to show this, that we are able to actually do a whole uh, uh, semantically, we were able to build partial order on top of TCP, which I find quite interesting because TCP is supposed to be ordered and then you build partial order on top of something that's fully ordered is interesting, I think. Uh, but the fact is that we basically took out that ordering constraint, right? We weren't delivering in order anymore. So uh, we were able to build partial order and multi-streaming on top of this. Um, now this is, I haven't talked about, so there's a, there's a paper here, I'll, I'll give you a link to papers later. Um, they can look to see the other results and the other stuff that uh, we try to do with Minion. Um, we are still working on this. Uh, we con continue to work on this stuff, but much remains to be done. Um, Minion goes after transport abstractions. Right? It just goes after and tries to, tries to fix the problem that applications want better abstractions and we are not able to deploy new transport. So we said, well, let's stick with the wire format. Let's see if we can build more abstractions using the same wire format so that we are compatible with the network and we can build new things for the application. So we tried to do that and in an admittedly hackish way, but it aligns incentives quite well, I think. One of the nice, really nice things with Minion is that you don't need kernel support at both sides for this to get deployed. So if you have an application and you use Minion right now and your kernel supports UTCP, the other side does not, this will still work. Why is that the case? Because we retain the wire format. It doesn't matter if the middle is a middle box or it's the other end. As long as it understands a TCP state machine, everything will work just fine. So it's, it's quite nicely backward compatible. And as more boxes support UTCP and COBS, things only get better. Yes? It doesn't need to, it, that, that's a performance improvement if it does. Oh, I see what you're saying. Sure. Right, it's not an interoperability issue. So we were able to align these incentives well, and it's not, it wasn't by accident. We started off wanting to design this so that it could be incrementally deployable. Um, but there are a number of work areas that remain open and very broad work areas. Um, how do you tell reachability between endpoints? We still haven't figured this one out fully well. <coughs> we sort of have, again, hackish solutions for a number of things, but we still don't know how to even define and tell what reachability means. Does, what does it mean to say that I can't reach you, you can't reach me, but you and I can reach a third entity out there, what kind of reachability is that? I mean, it is a reachability. Skype uses it all the time. But it is something that we need to be able to define. Um, and how do you make middle boxes part of the architecture? It's a very big question. And I don't know if it's, a, uh, uh, if it's something. But it's a, it's a worthy question uh, that we ought to spend cycles on. Um, and I would love to see this happen. Is we have router maps, we have BGP maps, we have all kinds of maps. I'd love to see a middle box map of the internet. And I want to be surprised by this. I mean, I, I, this, is, this is something that I'd love to see happen. Again, I don't know that the map is, in fact, a feasible thing. <laughs> but I think that working on it will give us valuable uh, things that we can use. Um, with that, I'll close. Thanks. Questions? So in one of your diagrams, you showed how um, when you need a packet, like the packet arrives out of order, it's sort of placed into the sparse to be buffered, which makes intuitive sense to me. But how do you communicate this using Unix's existing like socket slash file description API? Because it, I've been thinking through this, but it doesn't seem to support that at all. So this is something that the application initiates. The application turns on the auto delivery option. So the application is. Um, well, how does the application know that, like, 
look, this is a gap, and this is a packet, and this is a gap. So oh, so where does it place that data in that stream? Well, how do you tell? Well, supposedly, at least the way you, your diagram looks, it was like the, the buffer was sparsely populated, right? Go on. Um, but how do you tell at which positions in the buffer you've populated and which you haven't? Right, that's where the sequence number comes in handy. Mm. So you can, you can, so what we do in fact, uh, the right way to do this is to implement this as a receive message where it's part of a C message header. One of the things in there is the sequence number and that gets right. delivered up to the application. Right, so it's not actually reading into a byte stream buffer, it's, it's getting, message, getting individual messages. Individual segments, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Good question. Yes. I was wondering if you could explain why on your results graph the UCOB line was always under the UDP one. Sure. That's a very good question. So so we have uh, this one. Why is it always under? Yeah. So when it's under, it means what? It means that it's 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 encountering more burst losses. Right. right? So TCP does this thing called congestion control that still limits how much data it can send in any round trip time. So um, so it will it does lose to UDP just a little bit. But what you what you will see if you look carefully, well maybe it's not evident in this graph. This is one example. But what you will see is that in some cases UDP just doesn't deliver anything at all. Because it's not retransmitting. But TCP <coughs> does deliver everything. So you will get even if there's a loss, it there's a chance that the receiver might actually receive a retransmission before it's time to play it out. So the both of those things are going on together. But in this case I, I think it's because of the congestion control. So, sir, uh, let's thank Jana again. <laughs>